You know, uh, it is a tough time, I think, for so many people in the world, but certainly from the point of view of a central banker. Um, setting your forecast, setting your plan to fight off the damage from the coronavirus in New Zealand, you know, your, your view of the economy right now has four scenarios, and they range from something like the quarterly GDP number coming in at minus four or minus 37 percent. How do you set policy? How do you manage when there's so much uncertainty about where we are, where you are, and where we're all going? Uh, great questions, and I, I certainly um, don't feel we need sympathy. I mean, being a central bank governor at this point um, is is not only challenging, but um, you know, very exciting. And I'm pleased that you know we will still remain employed for the time being. So um, I feel privileged um, rather than pressured. But in terms of setting the policy, uh, whilst you know, while the challenge is probably in terms of the outlook is the hardest ever. In terms of what we need to do is probably the easiest ever. Um, you know, that the shock is global, it's significant, it will persist. Uh, fiscal policy is the first, um, first cab off the rank and, uh, you know, monetary policy is playing playing a, a bit part, really, a significant bit part. But um, we, you know, so for us, the obvious decision is as much as we can do as soon as we can do with regard to easing policy and keeping interest rates low and that yield curve flat and stable. Uh, to pretend we can do that with accuracy would be would be wrong. Um, you know, uh, there's no sense of perfection. That's why we call it uh, scenarios rather than predictions, but it's very clear, uh, quantitative easing, significant, and keep an eye on low and flat yield curve. Well, you know, uh, speaking of, of the keeping the yield curve flat, um, watching fiscal policy, certainly uh, the budget released by the government last week, I think uh, before it came out, even after people are wondering what it means for your target for uh, bond purchases this year. And of course, your assistant governor, Christian Hawksby, spoke to our Tracy Withers earlier today saying that that didn't really change much. So, but, but to get back to this bigger picture question, are you are you really only basing your sense of how many bonds you're going to have to buy or want to buy, how you're going to keep the yield curve flat, how you're going to keep your yields low based on how many the govern, govern, government is issuing? Um, are there other factors that are equally important to that? I, I think um, there are other factors that are actually the driver. You know, just to step back one, we have chosen to use quantitative easing, the large-scale asset purchase, as um, our preferred instrument, given that the official cash rate is, is so low, we don't want to go negative at this point. Um, we're prepared to if we have to, but but not until you know, a, a lot later. So government bonds are the obvious asset we can be purchasing. The good news is there's more of them coming on the market. Um, when we were talking about alternative monetary policy tools this time last year, one of the concerns for New Zealand, given the very low fiscal debt position was that we didn't have a lot of government bonds to actually buy. Well, that problem is certainly being resolved for us now. The way in which we think about it to retain our operational independence is that we think about the cap in terms of dollar billions of assets we want to buy. We don't think about it as a percent of total assets on offer. Um, what, of course, we get indemnified from the government for buying these bonds, you know, around the uh, mark-to-market positions, um, and that indemnification is set as a percent of the total bonds on offer, but that is not about our policy. That is simply about enabling, not about what we have to do. So we focus on inflation, we focus on employment, and we are targeting, you know, a low and flat yield curve um, through the purchases of bonds. So um, you also mentioned um, you know, the global outlook, certainly one aspect of the global outlook for New, New Zealand and what the economy is going to do and that all over the map forecast is what's happening in Australia, what's happening in China, your two biggest export markets. How do you see China's economy in particular performing right now and what is that going to mean for demand for New Zealand's exports, which is a very big part of your economy? That's right. I mean, we're, we're in a reasonably fortuitous position, put it this way, if you wanted to um, um, confront a crisis like we, like the globe is confronting, you'd want to start from where um, New Zealand started. So we had a, a pretty good terms of trade 
um, you know, good high commodity prices. We had low government net debt. We had very high labour force participation. We had inflation above the midpoint of the band. So all of these are good starting points. But without doubt, both New Zealand and Australia are trading nations. We need people to buy our goods and services. For us, for New Zealand, um, our particular goods still remain um, well bid, well sought after because they are soft commodities. They are food, they are uh, timber, fishing, you know, things that um, really remain in demand in China and they are largely consumed there. They're not part of a, a global supply chain that ends up getting held up somewhere else through final demand. I mean, final demand is China. So that is good. Australia is a little bit different, you know, with their harder commodities. A lot of those are intermediate inputs or primary inputs into ongoing further processing. The biggest part that is impacting the New Zealand economy from from the Chinese slowdown and, and global slowdown is is the fact that we can't travel and tourism and education is a significant component of both our country's GDP. Um, China in particular for the education and more so recently China for tourism. They've come up into the middle income group. Uh, during the global financial crisis, Chinese tourism was not a big issue. Um, now it is. So that is, you know, that's the biggest challenge, not necessarily goods, um, but more services and at that high end um, uh, labour intensive service area. I'm also curious, you know, when you see, uh, you know, so what, one of the biggest things driving anybody's economy right now is, is what's happening with the virus, what's happening with uh, the number of deaths, what's happening with the production of a vaccine. Um, some, there's U.S. starting to reopen in some areas. Uh, there's some pushback internally. Other nations trying to reopen as well. It, where do you see the world? Start with New Zealand and how it affects you, though, in terms of closer to reopening, getting there, something that will you know, reinforce gains in stock markets, or still at a very difficult place where it's too early to think like that? Um, I don't think it's too early. I think it's really important that we think about um, recovery and, and renormalization, think about the future. That's what keeps us as humans healthy, happy, and engaged, um, you know, sitting here worrying about what could happen um, is not useful. Our scenarios were, are based exactly on what you're saying. It's based on not our predictions of what happens, but just on the different types of possibilities around the health situation. In New Zealand, we have been being uh, the complicated folk we are, we, we coded it as to one, two, three, and four. <laughs> four being total lockdown um, based on based on the virus being in New Zealand and being spread um, through the communities. Um, we've managed to uh, contain the virus. There is no human-to-human -human, um, okay. contact that we can't trace. And we have shifted down through three, and we're now in two, where effectively New Zealand is open for business within New Zealand, subject to some constraints around how many people per building and you know, a bit of social distancing. But that will only take New Zealand so far. New Zealand has to be open to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And so this is our challenge. The benefit of being far away is that we've been able to contain and manage the benefit of only not having state governments, but just a central government okay. and local governments is that we've all been good citizens. Um, but our big challenge will be at what point are international borders open to people. Right. And this okay. is... This is a real concern for New Zealand. Uh, our goods, is, our goods, and goods can still be traded, but you know, a big part of the services, unless we can get um, feet on the ground here, um, it's it's very hard. Um, I want to ask you, of course, about negative rates because it is certainly a hot topic among central banks around the world. And I want to put this in a little bit of context too, because the Reserve Bank of New Zealand back in 1991 was the first central bank to move to an inflation target. So in a sense, it, RBN said has been a leader, a bellwether. So the fact that you, Adrian Orr, in effect have endorsed negative rates for, the, for New Zealand, I think makes this your position all the more important. Um, probably not till early next year, you say, but why do you embrace negative rates as something helpful to New Zealand's co co economy at this critical time when Jerome Powell at the Fed and all his uh, teammates say, no, it's not an effective tool for us. Why do you think it would be effective for New Zealand? Well, no pressure there, Kathleen, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> 
the, I embrace, endorse are two stronger words. We've said we want to retain optionality. And, you know, at this point, why remove options from your table if they can be of use? With monetary policy, there are always winners and losers, unders and overs. It's a blunt tool. Um, just as with positive interest rates, you know, savers versus debtors, elderly versus young, asset owners versus non-asset owners, etc. All of those relative challenges exist. Uh, with negative interest rates, that will remain the same, just as it does with quantitative easing, just as it does with um, term lending, just as it does with foreign exchange intervention. All of these different tools have positives and negatives. And what we're saying is let's keep the optionality. Um, and the optionality is about to have a negative wholesale interest rate if we deem that necessary and at that point the most effective tool that we can deploy. Um, so, you know, it's got to jump the hurdles. It's got to be seen to be necessary. It's got to be seen to be effective, efficient and operationally um, capable. In okay. fact, at the moment, it's the operational capability that, that was our biggest concern. Uh -huh. Um, in that some banks' systems just can't handle a negative number. No one ever thought that that would be the case. Well, uh, I can't talk for the other countries. I won't, but it comes down to a lot around thinking about what is the limit to a negative interest rate and wh what does it do and what doesn't it do to retail banks' balance sheets itself. So that's, that's the work we're doing, and I would never say never. We need to keep the options okay. on the table. So saying something's an option... Uh, it seems to me to make put a lot more doubt over it. Um, I guess I guess that that will be determined by. Well, or let me ask you: Is it going to be a question then of just in how bad a shape New Zealand's economy is down the road a few months? Is is that going to say, boy, we have to do something? Bond purchases haven't worked. Um, you know, the the impact is is deeper and longer. The fiscal spending. So now, boy, it's it's the last thing on the list. We have to try it. Is is that the kind of optionality it is? Uh, it, that is the type of thinking, but it's certainly not the last option, and um, and we wouldn't be doing it even even if we didn't think it was going to be effective. So, so you, you're dead right. The very first thing is down the road. What further stimulus, if any, do we need? Are our current tools, our our purchasing, you know, government bond quantitative easing, is that still working? Have we still got headroom? Mm -hmm. Is it achieving what we're doing? Are uh, the markets functioning? So, you know, there are lots of very sensible questions we can ask, at which point we still know that a negative OCR is, is, is an option. And so, you know, I just don't really see any downside to it um, to keep that optionality available. Um, probably if you talk to a retail banker, they might talk differently, but that is uh -huh. the price of, you know, yep. of, of making the profits they've made. Well, speaking of retail bankers, um, you um, mentioned a couple of times at the press conference after your policy meeting last week that um, you noted that even though the OCR, the official cash rates, come down, retail rates of banks have not. And you said you were pretty sure that you know banks are going to realize that if they want to make the LSAP, the bond purchase program, effective, they've got to be on board. They need to lower those retail rates too. Um, would Pushing the rate down to negative put a little more pressure, the OCR rate that is, put more pressure on those bankers to say, oops, I guess we better do this. I, th I absolutely think it would. Um, you know, the first, the most significant pressure we can have is called competition. Um, I do get frustrated when people say there's just not enough competition there so we don't have to move. Um, you know, I'm not sure why people would say that publicly. Um, uh, the competition... I, I can rationalise um, why the retail interest rate margins have remained where they are, if not slightly higher, as, as, these, as the wholesale rates have come down, in part because uh, funding is done through deposits, um, and so there's a comp competition to keep the deposit base there. It's done through international um, debt issuance, and there was some volatility um, out there uh, in the markets. But as... as uh, demand for credit picks up, which it already is now that we're allowed back out of our houses, uh, competition should come back to the fore and that and um, you know that, that retail pressure will come on banks to be competitive. Uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant, so we will keep shining light on it um, to say, you know, what are you doing? We're not lowering rates in order for you to increase your profitability. We're doing it to get to the end point. A negative OCR, without doubt, well, that's saying, bang, you're done. You know, this is, um, you are having to um, 
it, it, it certainly impacts the funding opportunities uh, quite directly for banks. Uh, but I'm very confident that uh, the margins will 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 reduce and um, the feed through will be will be full. You know, again, I'll, I'll look at a, a global question that you've looked at for many years, um, and that's inflation versus deflation. I think many more central bankers seem to say, oh, no, I'm much more concerned about deflation. That's why I'm creating special programs. That's why I'm bond purchases, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some, loud, you know, some significant voices out there saying maybe not today, maybe not next week. But there's so much stimulus created by the RBNZ and others that this is definitely going to push up prices and we are going to have an inflation problem. What's your view? Uh, well, I really do hope that um, that um, we are confronted with some of those risks in the future because that means that we have been successful, i.e. aggregate demand has picked up above supply um, and we're back into a more business-as-usual situation. Um, with the business-as-usual situation, it means that we would have to taper our bond purchasing, lift the interest rates and, and you know, continue as normal. Um, at the moment, the, the, the impact is so large, the fear of inflation um, is very small relative to the fear of, of, um, of disorder, dysfunction, unemployment and, and possibly even deflation. So, you know, I'm not, I'm, I think the balance of risk is pretty obvious, okay. but there is no free lunch in this, without doubt and we would have to be acting down the path of the future. It's the same for governments who are, right. who are issuing debt. You know, at some point, the price of that debt will rise, and at some point, people will be saying, um, uh, wow, what's going to happen to my taxes, or are you going to start mm -hmm. making cuts or paying things back? You know, this is about getting through these periods. I want to call on another part of your history, which was when you ran um, New Zealand superannuation fund uh, quite successfully. So you've, you've worn that hat of being an investor, having to choose uh, securities, you know, see where it's a good place to put some money to make some money or not. If you were looking at uh, the world right now, if you were looking at, uh, you know, your bond purchases, the possibility of negative rates, all kinds of things, how would you be? How would this affect your view of where you would put money to at least keep it safe, if not make some? Yeah, I'd probably um, always stick with the big picture. Um, so the first thing is over what horizon are you investing for? Uh, you know, so that will really um, be determined what you're about. The second one is how do, can you remain liquid through these periods? If you're a long-term investor, obviously opportunities are going to increase over the next few years around entry prices into new markets and current markets. Um, uh, so you want to be liquid, you want to um, retain the confidence of your investors and be able okay. to identify when the price um, is well below the long-term value of those assets. And that will be the make of a fantastic long-term uh, okay. investment manager. Okay. Um, some of the challenges will be there will be new things and old things. Well, I want a quick final question, just a few seconds to answer, but uh, because we, we've run out of time here. Yeah. Um, would you buy New Zealand bonds right now? Uh, yes, I do. Would you? As a, you oh, okay. Easy question to answer. <laughs> but I mean, besides, oh, well. <laughs> well, I am, buy I, I am buying them. So. Okay, the RBNZ is Quite buying. Quite a few, actually. Yeah, actually, many, many, many. <laughs> okay. Adrian Orr, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.